Well, welcome to the podcast, Dave. Hello, how are you? I'm not too bad, thank you. How about yourself? Yeah, yeah, I'm good. I'm good. <laughs> good, that's what I like to hear. So we're going to talk a little bit about foraging today, which is something I know uh, worryingly little about. And I thought we should probably start with, uh, where, well, where did you start with foraging? Presumably hunger is what made you started foraging. <laughs> it's, I, I was thinking about this because this is normally how any interview starts, is how did you get into it? Yeah. And I normally do quite a long-winded answer because it's it's not, you know, there, there are lots of in points. And, and, and I find when anyone's into a subject, they often try and feign that they've been into it since they were an embryo. <laughs> you know, um, but I mean, the truth is that there were sort of little dabblings when I was young, when I was uh, a child, so making that soup, things like that. But I think the turning point was probably a trip to Wales in my early 20s um, and it hitched from the Glastonbury Festival. Uh, it was quite a sort of chance meeting, really. A friend uh, had met someone in India, as people do when they were traveling, they gave them their address and said, please turn up, uh, you know, turn up whenever you like, not expecting anyone to do that. And uh, so my friend and two others, uh, me and someone else, turned up at their land. Uh, they had an antiquated foraging book and I sort of became quite absorbed with it. And the guy we were staying with um, took me on a bit of a walk and kind of got me started with that. And I think from there, it just got to be I mean you you're into a subject you know what it gets like you get nerdy about it don't you and then yeah oh definitely and then it builds and builds um yeah and you start buying the books and you start uh it's a slippery slope program. yes yeah yeah <laughs> um so yeah I, I think it just it, it built and built to be honest so so from about sort of 21 onwards so I'm in my kind of late 40s now um and it just conti continues to grow I'm learning new things all the time so yeah <laughs> that's great how, how much are you i mean I'm, I'm guessing foraging really should be a supplement like people aren't making their entire diets out of foraging presumably are they it's like just a little a kind there's of, some people that do actually but is I, there I really uh, yeah the wow. uh, monica is it monica wild i think i think her surname's wild you know quite appropriate yeah um <laughs> she's spending a year eating nothing but wild food she comes up on instagram quite quite a lot and shows the things she's she's making uh so you can it's a lot of work if you do yeah, um, yeah. i've got two kids i've got a mortgage to pay so <laughs> <laughs> yeah not quite uh, uh, doable yeah i can't quite do it not not well not and keep my relationship i think you know it's, uh... <laughs> i mean it's it's that age-old question do i go foraging or do i have a stable marriage and you know we've all asked ourselves that at some point haven't we <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Well, I mean, there must be an equivalent with bird watching. You know, it's uh, do do I go twitching or do I, you know, go out for dinner with my wife? Or <laughs> yeah, no, exactly. And and you know, it's a tough one. It's a tough one. So we've got to you've got to think toss the, a coin coin toss usually. Yeah, it, that's how it? I not normally it depends on the bird, doesn't it? If it's a sexy bird, then you've got to go out and get to go out and, and <laughs> twitch it. And um, people can get kind of worried about foraging particularly with mushrooms and i guess because you've done so many interviews this must come up all the time um, and yeah, yeah, what yeah. what are the what are the do's and don'ts then of, of foraging I'm, I'm sure i mean you've done you've literally done the book on it so i'm sure there's a lot to, to talk about it but what yeah, are the kind of is, basic, basic do's and don'ts i i think sort of learn your poisonous ones first is a good start uh, yes. <laughs> learn what not to pick yeah so um the death cap um there's a aptly named destroying angel and they're oh, part wow. of, yeah, uh, they're part of the Amanita. I, I can never pronounce that. It sounds a bit like a man eater, a man eater <laughs> family. Um, and I think learn those. They're, they're sort of very distinctive. They come from a sort of egg form uh, and grow up, and they've always got a veil around them, um, and they're gilled. So I think learn what the what the, the most poisonous ones look like first. And I think don't rely on an app. Uh, I, I've I've um tried these before uh and scanned mushrooms and plants with them sometimes they're right but sometimes they're worryingly wrong and can say the poisonous ones are edible and vice versa yeah um so i think it's a case of cross-referencing as many different um so learn your poisonous ones uh narrow it down this is for mushrooms well it works for plants as well narrow it down 
and cross-reference with, say, an app or two, a couple of books, uh, including this one. <laughs> get, the plug plug in, get the plug get in the while plug you in. can, yeah. <laughs> including but, this one. So I've got uh, Latin names in this, and it's, it's good to Google those, and then you get Google images, and you see lots of versions of, of the different plants. Am I right in thinking that there's only a couple that would actually kill you, but there's a lot that would make you kind of poorly? Is that right? More or less, yeah. yeah. And you do have to know. Um, I'm trying to think that uh, there's a few that will kill you. I mean, maybe. Oh, is there? Oh, okay. <laughs> maybe more than a couple, but they 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 can be quite rare. Um, and I think it's knowing. So, okay, take for example so the hedgehog fungus. Um, yeah it's got spines instead of gills there's no poisonous lookalike for that um the cauliflower fungus looks like a big cauliflower or a brain there's no poisonous lookalikes for that um i think start with very simple ones such yeah. as that and then then build on those so get to know the sort of main groups of poisonous ones like the web caps like the um and then uh and then get to know your sort of more common ones and get this sort of take baby steps in. Giant puffball is one of the first mushrooms I ate, um, which is a uh, the only thing you can mistake that for is a football, really. You know, it's um, <laughs> a big white mushroom. So uh, yeah, I think start easy. I, I, the temptation is to run into the woods, I, and I, I'm guessing this is it works perfectly with bird watching as well. If you go out and try and identify every single bird you see that day you're going to fall flat quite quickly yeah if you yeah. pick one or two out and then slowly build on that you're going to slowly build up a reptile and it's exactly the same with identifying plants and mushrooms and i guess it sounds very obvious but if you're not sure don't eat it yes i mean yeah, I, I absolutely probably shouldn't have to say that but you know if someone's <laughs> like well maybe that's okay om nom nom and then off you go so i think yeah if you're not sure then just that's a that's the golden rule really yeah yeah, yeah. No, definitely. And what what let's say that someone has gone down this this uh, route, they've eaten something and think, uh oh, I shouldn't have eaten that. What what do you do? Is it is it that's or, it? Um, you're, you're fucked or or, or can you kind of <laughs> <laughs> or, 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 you know, is there a way out of it? Uh, I think ring ring nine 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 and a priest. Yeah, and a priest. <laughs> you can make yourself sick. You can eat charcoal um, or, or charcoal tablets. Uh, having some milk thistle on hand um but it's best to, prevention's better than cure yeah oh no know. i'm not advocating people <laughs> deadly mushrooms and then try and get out of it i'm just thinking if someone did eat something and think hmm, what do i do now then uh, that's, oh, that's I think, uh, yeah i mean there's things like trooping funnels that can look a lot like uh sort of more more poisonous species yeah and so they can be a case of picking the wrong thing thinking 100 percent you've got the right thing uh and th there's a brilliant story there's a guy called gordon hillman who used to do a um program with ray mears he was this very academic guy um and he ate a poisonous mushroom and realized his mistake when he started to feel faint that the, he's a, he was a lecturer and he started to feel faint in the student union bar and quickly jotted down on a piece of paper the species of mushrooms that he, ate, he had eaten and then passed out wow <laughs> and, and if he hadn't have done that you know um uh it, it wouldn't have been seen to quite as quickly and they wouldn't have known what was wrong with it because it could have been anything yeah of know? course uh, one too many it's... sambucas or something you wouldn't know yeah would you? exactly wow exactly but it's like i've eaten blah 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 and then passed out so uh it's a presence of mind to, <laughs> to not only write down the mushroom but to write down the latin name of it yeah well. yeah yeah so Bloody it's hell. quite commendable definitely yeah, so. <laughs> is there uh is there a best time to forage i mean i guess a lot of us think you know, autumn for mushrooms and and berries and whatnot and then maybe spring for for bulbs but presumably you can forage all year round but is there a best, yeah, time? best time yeah there are things all year the dead of winter tends to be a little bit um more tricky um, spring and autumn are the main two seasons. Uh, so the wild garlic and spring leaves. Um, so I, I, if I, I run courses, got some coming up at the weekend actually. Um, and I tend to put them on in spring, sort of around uh, April, May. 
and then September, October as well. So they're my two main seasons, but that's not to say there's nothing in between, nothing each, each end, but that's the main, they're the main foraging seasons really. Yeah, but, that makes, uh, that makes sense. Cause yeah. I guess there's more around at that, that time of year, I suppose. Yeah, but you would always find something. Um, chipweed is perennial and nettles you find most times of the year. Uh, and in fact, sort of March time, you can get the first new shoots of things and it's the best time to, to forage certain things like um, uh, goose grass, sticky weed. Uh, you can eat that before oh, okay. it gets all sort of straggly and long. You can, you can eat the uh, shoots of those. Oh, wow. I've not even heard of that. What would yeah. you eat that one with? Just like as a uh, salad, could... is it? Uh, it's better cooked, so you just pick up some sh pick some shoots up and uh, fry them up with a bit of butter and onion with uh, nettle shoots as well. Ah, so that's just pretty. yeah, I think I think we're sort of um, in in kind of modern food. We tend to isolate food, so uh, if you buy an aubergine or if you buy a pumpkin, you'll look for recipes for those. When Really, people used to just mix everything together. So you'd have uh, something called buttered warts, W-O-R-T-E-S, which was a medieval dish. And they have the equivalent in Greece, uh, which uh, Horta Verde. I, I, I'm not very really good at other languages. Um, but there's equivalents in Greece and France and uh, um, Iberian Peninsula, so Portugal and Spain. And it's just basically cooked greens. So instead of picking one plant, you mix lots together. Uh, and warts used to be with buttered leeks and then nettles, nettles and mallow and wild garlic. And so, yeah, the springtime can be a great time to just sort of mix all those together. I guess the key as well is that there's a difference between edible and tasty, because I know there's a lot of plants that are edible, but they're not necessarily that tasty. No, and that's when uh, flavourings come in <laughs> yeah. very handy. So, so uh, you're not encouraging yeah. people to go out and literally graze, <laughs> start mun <laughs> munching out there. You need, a lot of these things need need a little a little jus, a little something to them. Yeah, yeah. And, and a lot of the books will use sugar, but you can mix sweeter berries with sour, more sour ones. So um, slows mixed with blackberries are quite nice and you can you can just about tackle them raw. Um, something I found the other day, and I, I, I've only done it once, and so I'd like to be interested to see if it works again. So I rubbed on a slow until the seed popped out and, and then ate it, and a lot of the astringency had gone. So I don't, I don't know if you know, if you eat a slow, it tends to, most of the moisture disappears from your Yeah, mouth. and I've, try, I've tried eating the, yeah, what didn't have much joy. So, what, so you eat the yeah. seed or you eat the mushy bit? You eat the mushy bit, so mushy you, bit. Okay. you push it until the seed pops out, okay. uh, and and that's taken off the sort of, uh, you know, the the sort of whitish hue that's on the outside of the slow, um, and got rid of the seed and sort of, you know, got some of the sugars going in the uh, berry as well, and that seems to sweeten it up. But I, I've, as I say, I've tried that once. I'd be interested to try it again next time I go out because it was only a couple of days ago that I tried that. So um, is, is that similar? Because I know with slow gin, you wait for the first frost. I guess that's more fermentation. I guess that wouldn't make any difference mm. for e eating them raw, would it? Um, you wait for the first uh, frost because it's, um, but you can you can simulate that by putting them in the freezer. Oh, OK, so, OK. Yeah, you can put them in the freezer a couple of times. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm going to have from the tap. We have gone off on a berry tangent, haven't we? But I, I am going yeah. to have a go at slow. I'm not a big gin drinker, but I am going to have a go at slow gin this year. Try and make my own. I am very, uh, very keen but to it try you, that. You don't have to stop at gin and slow. So any berry and any spirit you can mix together. So okay, um, uh, cherry brandy is a great one. Um, uh, yeah, that sounds nice. Yeah, mulberries in grappa. That's quite nice. I've had that uh, a, a while back. Um, yeah. So whisk and slow whiskey's nice. So that, that can be a really cheap whiskey as well. So Yeah, I'm a um, bit of a whiskey connoisseur. I'm not sure I'd have, if I've had the heart to mix a, a single malt with a berry. Maybe. Oh, no, don't do it with a single malt. No, no. do just, <laughs> just, a, just a cheap, nasty <laughs> one, yeah. Sacrilege, yeah. I think okay. I use uh, Smart Price whiskey. So it's... Uh... <laughs> okay, okay. I, I was going to have a mild, a mild cardiac arrest then. I can't defile that. No, 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 no. Defile yeah, that. No, no. <laughs> are there, are there any tal talisker and no uh... no no oh that's my favorite that's my favorite whiskey <laughs> yeah. yeah so no I, I wouldn't wouldn't dare do that um are there any yeah. laws on where you can forage i mean does it matter um, like 
I know like with Scotland, like there's right to roam. I mean, is it is it different in different countries in the UK or is it pretty much you can forage it's pretty much like? the same. It's pretty much the same as long as you don't make money out of it. Basically, uh, you okay. can pick um, root, uh, not roots. Roots is the only exception. So you can't dig up plants. Um, well, without the landowner's permission. So, OK, uh, OK. Yeah. Yeah. I know the local park keeper. So he allows me to sort of uproot certain weeds, not plants but weeds no, no. in the park um and uh yeah just bumping into a farmer i've got a, a private walk coming up and it's for someone who sells farm equipment and he knows the farmers pretty much for a 20 mile radius it seems from where we, we're foraging so oh, that's pre handy. mission yeah. for that but sorry to go back to that i keep going off on these tangents <laughs> so the law is you can pick berries leaves uh flowers um uh, as long as it's not a triple SI, uh, and you can do that as long as it's not from commercial gains. So it's pretty much you can forage most places. Um, there, and there's a difference between the law and sort of ethics. Uh, and a lot of creatures will rely on a lot of these, these foods as much as us. So you think uh, dormice will rely on the hazelnut. So seeing signs of that, so uh, recently I picked a lot of bilberries up in Yorkshire and uh, noticed signs of dormice there, I found a dormice nest. Um, yeah, it was lovely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um, and because of that, spread, spread the picking out so it didn't concentrate on that one place. Because if, if you consider for us, you know, it's quite easy for us to move around. For the, for the dormice, that's, you know, uh, it can be quite a, that, that can be his entire larder yeah um, yeah yeah. well i was going to ask yeah. you what kind of rules do you go by because obviously there's the law but then as you said there's personal ethics and things so is there anything yeah. that you kind of impose on yourself then yeah there is I, I i try not to go up to pick berries um so i'll pick the lower branches i mean some of that's convenient but then I, i'll leave the higher branches for the birds okay uh, and i'll spread spread the picking from as far and wide as i can for mushrooms, I'll leave the youngest and the oldest, and that's the youngest to take the place and then the oldest to spore. Um, and occasionally, if I've accidentally knocked one of the older ones out, I spread some of the, um, I, I take the gills off and spread some of the spores around. Uh, that, oh, so that, that will propagate then, will it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. That's, the, that's the theory. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I mean, if, there's just a lot about mushrooms because they, uh, as John Wright talks about this, it's quite interesting that he, he um, compares it to an apple tree, that you're not going to stop the apple growing by picking its apples. And most of the mushroom, most of the fungus is underground. Yeah. So my seal network, is that it? My, yeah, mycelium. Yeah, yeah. yeah, that's it. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah the, so the mycelium network will be underground. Yeah. Um, yeah. And you can pick the mushrooms from the top and you won't be disturbing the mycelium. You might be preventing it uh, growing elsewhere. And that's why it's important to sort of leave a few to spore. But you won't be damaging the organism as a whole. Right. Because um, yeah. timing's key with mushrooms as well, isn't it? I, when, I, when I do photography of mushrooms, I know that if you, know, if you get there, if you leave it too late, the slugs have got to it or, uh, or the frost or whatever. And if you're there too early, yeah. it doesn't quite look right. So uh, the classic one for photographers, I guess, is fly agaric. Photographers love oh, a fly yeah, agaric. Yeah. But trying yeah. to get them just right is a fucking nightmare. <laughs> it takes, <laughs> I, 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 don't, I, I live relatively close to Sherwood Forest, so that's where I tend to go oh, yeah. to try and photograph them in. And I've not done it yet where I've got one that looks just right. Either the slugs have bloody had it or um, yeah. or they're not quite there so time and i guess it's the same with eating you want to kind of collect yeah, yeah. them when they're at the right kind of stage and the nicest mushrooms are the ones that everything seems to want to eat um yeah yeah so, yeah <laughs> and interestingly about fly garrick um they they seem to have an association with the belitus mushroom so if you go back to your sites where you found the fly garrick go sort of a month earlier and you'll find the the porcinis, the the sort of very sought after oh, mushrooms. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, Not always, a... but they do no. tend to. Yeah. Well, that'd be about now, wouldn't it? Because they they'll be coming out. So if I go now, roughly, there might yeah. be some porcini. Oh, okay. Well, that's yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. that's my weekend sorted now. 
Yeah, yeah, mine can... too. Is, that... <laughs> <laughs> is it? Am I right um, in thinking? Is it fly garrick or hallucinogenic? If you munch on one of those, you'll go for a bit of a yeah. Trip. There's there's a bit of a preparation. Um, yeah, it's sort of uh, violent, <laughs> violent vomiting and wow. uh, and quite strong hallucinations. Yeah, not, <laughs> not the best mix, then, is it? No, 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 no. I mean, I guess you'd forget no. about the vomiting if you're on like a rainbow riding a unicorn for half an hour. You wouldn't mind too much, would you? <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but, but there's, um, I mean, there, it, it, the to avoid the sort of vomiting, and this is sort of shows shows how misogynistic some tribes were. That there were certain tribes that would drink reindeer <laughs> urine, so they'd let the they'd feed the fly garrets their reindeer, let them filter it through their livers and then drink the reindeer urine i think i've Quite heard this collect. yeah I've um, heard but, this. The, but other tribes would do it to the women so they'd have their, their women drink uh, eat the mushrooms and then they'd drink their wives urine so it's you know there's also that's quite problematic if you if you think about that in, with today's eyes it's... so what you're saying dave is i should get my wife to eat lots of fly agaric and then drink her urine that's the best way yes. to get high yeah, off them. yeah okay yeah. well um i'll pitch it to her when she gets home from work and uh <laughs> we'll see if our marriage can survive that but you know i'm yeah. I'm, I'm game for it so yeah halloween punch you know that's <laughs> <laughs> Oh, God. OK, well, if someone had said at the start of this, I'd be talking about drinking my wife's urine to get high. <laughs> I probably wouldn't have uh, thought we were going to go there. But you know what? I'm glad. I'm glad we are. Um, <laughs> yeah, that, was, that definitely was a tangent, wasn't yeah, it? That why was... not? Let's, <laughs> let's run with it. Um, so, I mean, the key question is, why should people go foraging then? Like, obviously, you're this champion of foraging. What would be your advice and, and, and kind of getting other people to do it? Why should they do it? I think what the... One of the first things is an excuse for a good walk. You know, it's a yeah. good excuse to just get out. Um, it's fresh food. It's healthy food. It's nutritious. You know, if you're if you buy a salad bag in a in a supermarket, it's carbon dioxide packed. And uh, I mean, that's why when you open it, it sort of wilts instantly. Um, the if you're picking a wild salad, often you've got just hours between picking it and it being on your plate. So uh so all the vitamins and minerals in that salad are perfectly fresh then you've got the other thing of food miles um that there's there's no food miles other than perhaps you'll drive out to where you've gone um well there was one more i, I keep having this thoughts sort of go in my brain and then sort of disappear almost <laughs> yeah <laughs> instantly um there's the fun of it oh I, I know what it was it's the it's the having new taste so that was being my driving force oh it's free it's free is, a, is another good one um but sampling new flavors so uh there's hogweed seeds this time of year um are an excellent spice and you won't find that spice anywhere else it's, it's almost the closest comparison is cardamom but it's like a citrusy cardamom Oh. And that's impossible to find anywhere else. Um, that's a really good a, point. I hadn't thought about that, but there must be so many flavors that you're just not going to find, yeah. in the, you know, in the supermarket or even, you know, farm shops and things where you might find some of this. There's so much of it you're not going to find there. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it, funnily enough, some, some of them are coming into farm shops. You can buy a hogweed seed uh, chutney that I've seen in oh. farm shops. Um, so some of it is coming in, but yeah, generally they're, they're still, there's, um, uh a, a weed that grows by uh water so water pepper um and it's related to japanese uh, uh nepalese coriander but it's it's almost like chili but it's a slightly different fire to it is the only way i can describe it and that's and an that, aquatic plant is it it's it's a marginal plant marginal so you'll plant. see it by, water yeah. pepper water pepper okay because yeah. i've got a pond so that would be i've got water mint already um, but yeah, so, yeah. So I could it'll add... grow. Okay. Yeah, it, it will grow where the water mint is. So it, yeah, it doesn't doesn't need to be in water all the year, but it's it, it can be a, a marginal plant. Okay. Yeah. Ooh, so that it's... might be one to add. Yeah, that'll yeah. be good. Good to get that. No, that sounds yeah, good. Yeah. Um, and have you got a favorite thing to forage? I mean, obviously, I, and I guess you must get asses all the time as well. But is there one thing that you're like, I can't wait for that time of year to come around to go and get that specific thing, or is it more of a collection? Uh, I, I think spring wild garlic, definitely. Um, and then chicken of the woods this time of year. Um, that's uh, that's the big 
kind of fungus that tastes like chicken is it or yes. yeah yeah <laughs> okay. and I, yeah <laughs> and I, i'm a veggie um and it's it's one of those things that the entire family can eat and my my kids just started school but when he was in nursery he would talk to his nursery friends about it and none of them knew what he was talking about it was excellent it was and i think there's that association with it as well that it's it's something that I like. It's something my kids love, and they want to find as well, and they get excited when we find it. Yeah, and that no, really definitely. adds to it. Yeah. <laughs> going, going back to wild garlic as well. Like I know in the spring you can smell it, can't you? You'll be walking yeah. through, say, a little glade or something, and there is that kind of faint garlic whiff on the air, and that's kind of a, a sign of spring in a way, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. I it's a lovely like sign of spring. Yeah, it's definitely good to to have that. Well, that more or less brings me. To, to the end of it Dave but before we go if people want to find out more about foraging you obviously run courses you've got your book so presumably the best yeah. way to see those is your website yeah davehamilton.co.uk um the book's available just about everywhere so where the wild things grow yeah um yeah strongly recommend that so I would <laughs> um. <laughs> nice a nice self-endorsement <laughs> yeah and uh um at dave hamill uh, so at dave wildish is my tag for twitter and instagram so nice one well there. i'll put links That's to all that in the description thing. as well so people can kind of just click on that and, and find that but look it's been a pleasure talking to you dave and uh yeah, take likewise. care cheers yeah. cheers then bye